You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. In my hand, that which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God. The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the word says I am. I can do what the word says I can do. I have what the word says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, the word of God is being confirmed in my life with signs following in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah and amen. Look at the person to the right or left of you and say, who's your daddy? <laughs> Look at the other person on the other side. Say, who's your daddy? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, the reason we're asking who's your daddy is because I really want you to think about it. Do you know who your daddy really is? If you don't know who your daddy is, then you can let other people tell you who your daddy is. And you don't want to have other people to try to introduce you or to describe your daddy and they have the position that they know him better than you know him. You ought to know your daddy. You ought to be able to describe him. You ought to be able to share your faith in him with other people. So if someone starts to ask you who's your daddy, you ought to be able to say, I know who my daddy is. My daddy is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And he's the expression, the physical expression of God the Father in bodily form. God is my Father in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit lets me know all I need to know about my daddy. I know who my daddy is. Did you know that in the Gospel of Luke, that the Word of God describes in Luke chapter 3, it describes that Adam was the son of God in verse 38. Adam, the first man, was the son of God. And since he was the son of God, who was his father? God. God was his father. So then what happened to God? And as far as Adam's concern, what happened to his vision of God? Well, Adam had the concern or the thought that he would allow the devil to tell him who he was. And I want you to know something. Never let the devil tell you who God is. The devil is a liar, and he'll try to tell you that God is not good. He'll try to tell you that God is not great. He'll try to tell you that God doesn't have the benefits and the blessings and the concern for you that the Bible says God does. Who's your daddy? God is my daddy. And since God is my daddy, I don't let the devil tell me anything about my daddy. He didn't have to try to introduce me to my daddy. He didn't have to try to describe my daddy. He didn't have to try to tell me what to expect from my daddy. Because, devil, you don't know nothing about this. I know my daddy. God is my father. And since God is my father, and my life's pursuit is to enjoy fellowshipping with him, then I'm going to spend the, my whole life enjoying my intimate time with him. God is my father. Now, I told you to turn to Luke, the 15th chapter, correct? And we're going to get into the story of understanding who your daddy is. But let's, while you're there in the, in the gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, I want you to turn, since we're right there in the gospel of Luke, turn over to Luke chapter 2, 
Put a marker at the 15th chapter, but turn over to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to look at the second chapter, and we'll look at, let's see, verse 46. Luke chapter 2, verse 46. Well, look at verse 44. Verse 43. We'll look at verse 42. All right. Verse 41. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now, some of you may think, well, Pastor, don't you know where you need to go, where you want to go? Well, I do know, but it's all so good, and it all lines up so well that if I give you the previous verses, you'll help to understand that it's all in context. So that no one says, well, you're reading a verse of Scripture out of context. I'm not reading anything out of context. I'm going up further so you can see that it is in context. So we're looking at Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now his parents, referring to Jesus, his supposed father was Joseph, Mary, his wife, had birth, Jesus. And so therefore, Mary and Joseph were called his parents, referring to Jesus. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the what? At the feast of the Passover. That meant that the parents of Jesus, they took Jesus to Jerusalem in the temple. At least we know here how often? Every year. Do you know some parents don't take their children to church? Shame on you. Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to church at that time called the synagogue under the Old Testament. Verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. That meant that they had a habit. They didn't deviate from it. It was their custom to take their children to church. Or when I say children, we definitely know that Jesus was called their child. Verse 43, and when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolks and acquaintances. Now, kinsfolks means relatives. So that meant that not only did Mary and Joseph go, they also expected their relatives to go too. And also acquaintances. That meant that their neighbors and friends went with them to Jerusalem. I just am throwing this out there. How important is going to church to you? Some parents wonder why their kids are in trouble. Could it be you don't have a custom of going to church? Could it be that you would only invite your kinsfolks because you don't go? And could it be that your acquaintances certainly don't go because you don't go. My point being is, go to church. Now looking at verse 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. Now the word doctors is the word for teachers. And teachers are those who give forth doctrine. So therefore, doctors at this time were people who were known as teachers. The true understanding of a doctor is one who what? Teaches. And it came to pass, verse 46, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him, referring to Jesus, were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now, why would they be astonished? Because he's been coming to church ever since he was a child, a baby. And yet he's 12 years old, and even at the age of 12, he's coming to a place where he understands so much of Scripture that he was able to converse with those who were teachers and ask them questions, and if they ask him questions, 
He could get answers, and he would give answers. So it was this dialogue and exchange concerning the scriptures. Jesus was not ignorant of the Bible. At that time, they had the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. Jesus was informed in the scriptures. That's why he would ask people the question, is it not written? Is it not written? Is it not written? Hasn't it been said? He's looking at those who were challenging him as if to say, how come you don't know what's written? Where are you spending your time? How did you spend your years? What's more important than God? What's more important than being in the house of God? What do you think this is about? Do you think you're taking care of you? Have you not read that God took care of his people for 40 years in the wilderness with manna? 40 years. That's not a little snack. That is not a thing that just happened in a season. 40 years of sustaining his people. 40 years of them drinking water from a rock. Now, you can't come up and say, I need to work to take care of myself. You better understand where your provision really comes from. And Jesus asked the people, how is it you don't know? You don't know what the Bible says? You don't know what Scripture says? Too many people are ignorant of Scripture. But the beautiful thing about my response to that is, ignorance is a curable condition. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Looking at verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. We thought you were lost. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? In other words, how do you lose me? Don't you know where my love is? It's in the word. Don't you know where my constant passion is? It's in the word. How do you lose me? Where'd you find me? In the temple, having conversation about the word. I ain't lost, and you know where I am. So his mom's thinking, well, what, about, well, what do you mean you should be about your father's business? Now, he's looking at her like, Mom, you know, you know. In other words, you know that God is my father. You know that I was put in your womb by the Holy Spirit. You know that a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and that conception took place by the Holy Ghost's ability. You know, you know who my daddy is. My daddy is not a carpenter. Although my supposed father, Joseph, is a carpenter. I know that he works hard. I know that he provides for the family, the, and he does what he's supposed to do. But that, come on, Mom, you know who my real daddy is. Should not be about my father's business. And I'm asking you all who are children of God, shouldn't you be about your father's business? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? If you don't know who your daddy is today, you're going to find out, O oh, believer in Christ Jesus. Verse 50, and they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. What do you mean? He talks like somebody who knows his origin. He talks like he really knows what's going on. He talks like God is his father. And you know what? That means Joseph and I, we better be about the business of raising our children, but we got to get them prepared to know who? Who the real father is. Because when we get people talking about them, referring to their children, when we get them to know who God is through the scriptures, then basically God helps us to raise our children because they're his children but yet they're our children. We have a responsibility, but our responsibility is never to abdicate or to, to usurp the responsibility of who God is 
in their life. Some parents have not caught a hold of that responsibility yet. They are not raising their children in the Bible. They're not inoculating them against the infectious diseases of the world's doctrine. Consequently, they got kids that don't even know who they are. They have children that are doing things that are uncharacteristic. They're doing things that is like, what? How is a child learning how to be that destructive? Easy. When you don't inform them and raise them up in the word, then their minds are, to be, are being used by the devil. And there are too many parents that are allowing their children to be influenced by the devil. Verse 52 of Luke chapter 2. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. And that word stature means in age. That means he got older. And in what? And in favor with God and man. Why? Because he knew who his daddy was. And when you know who God is, you really intimately know him and he's your papa and you love him and you are there intimately acquainted with him. See, what's going to happen with you is that you'll get a boldness, you'll have wisdom, you'll have insight. You won't be waiting for people to try to describe to you who your daddy is because you know who your daddy is and your daddy talks to you. And you're not trying to get anybody to provide something for you as if to say, you're going to make me rich. You'll be like Abraham. And Abraham said, no man will say that God made me rich. I'm not taking the shoelace out of your shoes. You won't be able to point a finger at me and say, you did, you made me who I am. God made me who I am. God makes me rich. You know how God responded to that? God responded to Abraham and said, you know what, son? <laughs> he said, uh, I am your provider. And the way it's described in the Hebrew is this. If you ask me for something, if I don't have it, I'll make it for you. In other words, I got you. I got you. In the book of the Old Testament in Job, it says, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace, and good shall come unto thee. That means the more time you take to meditate and to get into the word, to know your daddy through his love letters, the Bible, the more you're going to be at peace, and the more good will come unto you. It's important that good come unto you, that favor flows unto you. <clears throat> I like when one minister said it this way, favor ain't even fair. I'm not asking for fairness. I'm asking and I'm enjoying the favor of God. See, the favor of God will promote you when other people say you can't be promoted. The favor of God will put you ahead and provide for you when other people say there's no provision for you in here. I ain't concerned about you. I know the favor of my daddy. See, me and daddy got it, all, got it going on. And since we have it going on, I don't have to be concerned about what the world says. Why? I don't need the world to try to describe to me what my daddy is like. I know daddy for myself. I know him for myself. And because I know him for myself, he's good to me. No, he's not. Well, you don't know how good he is. Maybe he's not your daddy. Because if you know who I know, and I know that God is good and his mercy endures forever, I know that he loves me and he loads me with blessings daily. Now, that's what he told me. Now, if you don't expect that for you, you need to talk to daddy. But I know what he told me. And so my life is sweet. I know who gave me my wife. A prudent wife is from the Lord. A man that finds a wife finds a good thing and favor with the Lord. I didn't want a girlfriend. I wanted a wife who would be my best friend in Christ. I know I'm preaching real good. I quoted a scripture to you from Job. But let me just go and just let you look at that before we get to You're still there. You've got a marker at Luke chapter 15, don't you? Let's look over at Job real quick. Let me give you that scripture so you'll know. <clears throat> I wouldn't 
just quoting it, but I want you to see it. Hallelujah. Uh, Job chapter 22, verse 21. Who's your daddy? Who is your daddy? The first Adam was the son of God, but he let the devil get in between him and his daddy. Jesus was told when God the Father spoke from heaven after Jesus was coming up out of the River Jordan, God the Father spoke in an audible voice and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He said, This is my Son, and I'm pleased in him. What do you think Jesus' response was? I always do those things that please my Father. No wonder he could walk on water when he didn't have a boat. No wonder he could pray and say, Daddy, thank you for feeding me and the people. I bless this food. And thousands of people ate on more than one occasion. What I'm saying to you is Job chapter 22, verse 21. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Let's all read that out loud together. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Some of you didn't really let that soak in. I want you to read it again with your own voice and let your ears hear yourself read it. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. That means the more I'm acquainted with him, the more at peace I'll be. And what else is going to happen? Good. What's going to happen? Good. What's going to happen? Good. Not bad, but what? Good. Not tragedy, but what? Good. Not catastrophe, but what? Good. I don't care what's going on in the world. It ain't got nothing to do with me. I'm taking time to acquaint myself with daddy. And daddy told me I'll be at peace. And there's going to be challenges in the world. The more the things happen that the news media reports on, and people are wondering, what's going on? What's going to come up next? The, e, you know, the EU and the Union and the UK, what's happening? What's going on with money? You know what? If you acquaint yourself with him, you'll be at peace. And what's going to happen to you? Put your name there. Good should come unto thee. You put your name there in your own Bible. Because you have to receive that as a personal statement from God to you. That good was, is going to come to you. And since good comes unto you, then what's your expectation for the future? Good. Hallelujah. Now get me to preaching around here. All right. Now. Also, since we're there, we might as well just look at this too. Look at uh, Job chapter 22. You still there? Verse 26. For then, this is after you've taken time to acquaint yourself with him. For then thou shalt have the, thy delight in the Almighty and shalt lift up thy face unto God. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon that way, on thy ways. That means I won't be in darkness ever. I'll never be confused. I'll never be perplexed. I'll never be disheartened. I'll never be dejected or distressed. Why? Because I know daddy. And daddy said, good will come unto me. And he said, I can decree a thing and it shall be established. I will pay my vows to him. Why? Because God is my provision. And what I promise to do, he will make it come to pass in my life because I will keep my word. Me and God's got it going on. Me and my daddy have it happening. Who's my daddy? God is my father. And when God is your father, you grow up with a confidence. How do you know your marriage will be strong? Because he holds all things together through the power of his word. And I know what his word says. 
How do you know you'll be able to be financially able to do all that you desire to do? Because my God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And Jesus is my Lord. How do you know you can handle the tasks that are awaiting you? How do you know you can graduate school? How do you know you'll be able to, ca to carry out the responsibilities of your business things that are before you? How do you know you'll be able to do those things? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What, do, you, do you have a response outside of the Bible? No. No. Well, let me give your, let me, let me have your opinion. Uh, here's my opinion right here. That's my opinion. His word is my word. What he says is what I say. And how he, how he approaches things is the way I approach things. Me and daddy are one. I let this mind be in me, which was in Christ Jesus. I don't think it robbery to be equal with my father. God is my father. If my daddy does it, I do it. If my daddy tells me what to do, I just do what he says to do. I should be like my father. It would be a crazy thing for my children to come out barking like dogs with a tail and ears, sniffing on the ground trying to find something to eat. That'd be crazy. Why? Because we're humans, and I expect my children to have human attributes. If God is my father, I should be godly. If God is holy, I should be holy. If God is smart, I should be smart. God knows everything. That means if I want to know something, I can go and ask him. Oh, Pastor Ziegler, see, you just, what kind of, what kind of program you teaching, man? That, what, what are you saying? You're saying that you've got a direct access with God the Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he knows everything? I'm saying that's exactly right. Well, see, uh, see, you New Testament believers, you just think, hey, well, let me explain. Even Daniel in the Old Testament knew that God, he considered him as his father, even though he wasn't born again, because nobody could be born again at that time. Jesus hadn't come on the scene yet, been crucified, died, and resurrected from the dead, and ascended up on high. Jesus hadn't died yet. So therefore, the people could only get, and they, they could have hope for salvation, but they could not yet have faith for salvation in reference to being born again. That's New Testament. But when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the leader of the world, when he had a dream, he didn't even remember what the dream was. He just knew the dream was important and it had to be interpreted and it had to be given to him. Nebuchadnezzar said, I need my wise men to come and tell me what my dream was. And all of the counterfeits, all of the masqueraders, they were like, well, we can't tell you what your dream was. Nobody knows. Nobody's even made that request in all of history. We study history. Nobody can make a request and tell us. You're asking us to tell you only what you knew and you forgot it, and now you want us to tell you what it is? He said, yeah, I feed you. I give you clothes. You guys have palaces. You all are my wise counsel. Tell me what I need to know. I need to know something. Well, get, tell us what the dream is, king and then we'll tell you what the interpretation was. He said, I know you're trying to buy time. If you don't tell me by such and such a time, all of your heads are off. You're not going to sit up here and have me take care of you and you call yourself wise and you can't come up with what I need. I'm the king. What I say goes. Now I'm telling you, I need an answer. I need to know what my dream was. I need to know the interpretation of the dream. And since you claim to have all this connection with God, then you better talk to God and come up with this answer. Otherwise, you're getting ready to go meet him. They were like, oh, no, we've been found out. We've been found out. They're playing. And the world is doing that now. They're playing games with God. But it's coming down to the point where if you don't know him personally, if you're not acquainted with him, it's going to show up. 
And so the decree was made, kill all the wise men. Daniel says, why is the decree so serious and why is it so soon? And the guy that was going to kill Daniel said, hey, look, king said, somebody better tell him his dream and what the interpretation of it is. And if they don't, all of the wise people, heads come off. Daniel said, may I go see the king? King says, Daniel, what can I do for you? Daniel said, uh, <clears throat> king, I'm going to go pray. Just give me time to pray. My God, who I serve, will tell me the answer that you're looking for. See, this is what we're going down to, people. We're getting down to this now. If you don't acquaint yourself with God, you're not going to have peace. Good ain't coming to you. It's going to get real ugly and real dark and real bad. The world is going to that place. The world is going to that. The only people that are going to what? Know are those who know God. They'll shine as bright stars in the firmament. You'll walk in the glory of God. And every time you get in a situation where it looks like you need something, you talk to daddy and daddy says, here's the answer. And you're just constantly rising up, being blessed, being promoted. They're handing out red slips to other people, pink slips, and you're getting green slips. They're telling there's no room at the end for you. But you're like, my daddy provides for me. And he does. Daniel prayed, came back, and said, King Nebuchadnezzar, yes, Daniel, I hope you have the answer, because if you don't, this is the last time you're going to talk with me. He said, of course I have the answer. I prayed. My God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. My God made everything. The earth and the fullness thereof belongs to him. The gold, the cattle, the, the cattle that the hills graze on, they belong to my father. I'll tell you what your, what your dream was. Told him his dream and the interpretation thereof. And the king said, <clears throat> I'm now promoting you. You are the chief wise man. And Daniel, I'm going to give you so much wealth that nobody will ever question how much love I have for you. I'm telling you, it's coming down to this. People who are playing with God, they're not going to have answers. But people who love God and are acquainted with him through his word, oh, you're going to have answers. Sweetness is coming upon you. Things are coming to you that your angels have prepared, had God had already prepared them for you. There are going to be things happening for you, promotions for you, the blessings for you, houses will be given to you, cars will be given to you, clothing will be given to you, jewelry will be given to you. You're just going to have blessings. Lands. But you say, wait a minute, now, do I just lay back and wait on it to come? Now, you're going to have to be a child of God and act like a child of God and act responsibly. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, but with it he adds no sorrow. What are you going to do with a house if you don't even want to clean a one-room sack that you're in? Well, I want a car. You are complaining about bus fare. How are you going to put gas in the car? You got to change the oil in the car if it's not a, a, oil, you know, a car that's just all electric. And if it is all electric, you're going to find some place to charge it. Charging station connected to a house or go to a charging station that's going to require some money from you. If you're complaining about money, how are you going to handle the things that God's going to provide for you? That is already provided for you. You can't discipline yourself. How are you going to be involved in disciplining little people that come from the union of a man and a woman? You're out of control, but yet you want to be in control of something. First thing you need to do is discipline yourself in the Lord. Grow up in Jesus and stop acting like a slave to sin. Turn over to Luke chapter 15. You got to mature. Grow up in Christ. The Bible tells us, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I understood like a child. I spoke like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, what do you mean? When I grew up in Jesus, I stopped talking like a kid. When I grew up in Jesus, I stopped acting like a slave to sin. When I grew up in Jesus, God's commandment and instructions to me were no longer hard to hear. But I welcome the instruction of God. Why? Because they're for my benefit. 
so that I may grow and prosper and be a blessing as I'm blessed. Daddy is not bad. God is good. But it's too many of his children that are hating on him. It's too many of his children that are walking like people outside of the family. Consequently, you want to know why we're having a situation here where you're looking at the elections like, what candidate can we actually vote for as Christian people? You got one that's saying, I'm going to back up everything that's confusing and crazy. And then you got another one that is like, you know, he's just going to do whatever he wants to do. You know, consider, he don't consider how he impacts other people with his, his speech. So it's like Christians are saying, what do we do? Who do we vote for? It's time for you to wake up now. You are the children of the Most High God. The government shall be upon his God's shoulder, which is on Christ Jesus' shoulder. Instead of you voting for the world, now you need to vote on Jesus. Now you need to depend on the Christians to rise up and be who you say you are. Be the leaders of society. Be the leaders of society. Your salvation is not in human government. Your salvation is in Jesus. Now be the kings and priests that you're supposed to be. Take control of your households. Take control of your neighborhood. Take control of your state. Take control of your country. Take control of your influence with other nations. Why? Because you're royalty. You are the solution. They're looking for answers from other people. They don't care nothing about God. They tell you they don't care nothing about God. They tell you they are enemies of God. Why would you put your confidence in them? Put your confidence in your Father. <laughs> that doesn't mean you shouldn't vote. In the election, because like, oh, Lord, who do I vote for? But one thing for sure, I'm going to listen to you as to how to vote. And I'm going to pray for the person that will be eventually in leadership and the political arena. But you know what? As Daniel was the one really running Babylon, so we'll be the ones really running United States of America and other nations of the world. Did you hear what I said? We'll be the ones running Korea. It's like, who's going to run Korea? I mean, you got North and South Korea. What do you do? Uh, Christians in Korea, run Korea. Christians in India, run India. Christians in Europe, run Europe. Christians in Japan, run Japan. What do you mean run? Influence. Allow the light of God, the glory of God to be so strong in you that when other people are wondering, how are we going to do this? The Christ in you is the hope of glory will shine forth. You're there in Luke chapter 15. Now I wish for people to stop moving around, be still, and this is really, really important. Stop moving. You got to go to the restroom, go to the restroom, and then sit in the back row. But stop moving. It's a disrespectful thing to the spirit of grace. And my eyes are running toward the people who are moving, and you all are not even concerned about how it influences me. You can't go to a orchestra presentation and get up and move around do an orchestra presentation. In fact, if you're not there at the beginning of the show or you don't get in during the intermission, you're not getting in. You say, I paid a ticket. They don't care nothing about that. You're not going to disturb the artiste that are playing. Don't do despite to the spirit of grace. Did you hear what I said? Don't dis do despite. I'm just getting up. I'm just going to leave. I'll be there when I get back. Stop it. It's rude. It's wrong. And I'm only saying it because I love you enough to train you how to behave yourself in the house of God. That's my responsibility. That's in the book too. Luke chapter 15. You there now? Verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of, the, of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. 
And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Now, circle the word began. What do you mean he began to be in want? He never knew what want was. This is his first encounter with want. See, sometimes God is so good to you, there's some things you don't even know you're not experiencing. But then when you think, like this guy here, not you, but when a person thinks, who is a believer, thinks, well, you know what? I think I can do better on my own. I don't really need God to tell me what to do. I can run my own life. I got it going on. I got some money in my pocket. I come from a good background. I know what it's like to have a good living. So let me just go ahead and do what I want to do. And that was his attitude. Because his attitude was, everybody's like me. When you're grown, you can do what you want to do. You're independent from God. You're getting ready to find out. There are circumstances you're not going to be able to control outside of God. There was a famine in the land. How do you change the effects of the famine without God? How do you? The economies of the place where he went to were going downhill fast. People are scrapping and scraping. They're looking for a way to survive. And he happens to be with them in that place. Now he's thinking, you know what? I ain't never been here before. I've never experienced this before. Why? Because in daddy's house is provision. See, daddy got it going on. Lay down what he want to lay down. Gas in his car. He had all, he could eat when he want to eat. Go to the refrigerator. Everything is good. But you get outside of daddy's house. You find out everybody ain't living like this. It's like here at Spirit Food. This is a good church. This is a good church. There's provision. There's blessings. If you're a member here, you got it going on. You say, what if I'm not a member there? You best become a member. And some people are hesitating. They're like, well, I ain't too sure I want to be. Then that's on you. If you, don't, if you don't qualify for the goodness, that's on you. But I didn't disqualify you. You disqualify yourself. If you don't come, that's freely given and receive the word, that's on you. This is a good place to be at. The Father God loves the people of God here at Spirit Food, and he loves his own people all over the world. But every pastor doesn't run the church like we run this church. And when I say we, meaning I just listen to the Lord and I do what he says to do. You don't have to scuffle here. Life doesn't have to be hard here, and it should not be hard here. Oh, you talking against other pastors? No, I'm not. I just know me. I know the teacher. I know the Father, and I know what he wants. Why are you mad at me? Because I'm confident about I know what he wants. He wants me to live holy. So there is no scandal here. I don't have another woman outside of my wife. Your children are safe here. I would defend your children with my life. I'm not going to come up in here and mess with these children. I'm not going to come in here and mess with these people. We don't play. We don't play. And don't try it. We have angels that are looking out for us. And God blesses us. If you are attending here, if you're a member here, you are blessed. Everybody's not living like this. Everybody's not being taught this. They're being straight. So the young man, the younger son, left and began to be in want. Verse 15 of Luke 15. And he went and joined himself to a what? a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Swine is another name for pigs and hogs. Some people are, I won't eat swine, but at this time, the hogs, the swine are eating better than this guy who came from his daddy's house. The swine were going to eat him. Verse 16, and he would have feigned, that means given up and died, have filled his, his belly with the husk 
that the swine did eat. In other words, man, that, the food that the swine were eating was, was starting to appeal to him. And no man, and notice this, and no man gave to him. See, some Christians are getting ready to find out. They join themselves to the citizens of other countries in the sense that they feel like, I don't need to take my time in the house of God. They're going to find out. You're not in the house of God, it's pretty much over. All right, read on. Verse 17. And when he came to himself, when he came to himself, now what do you mean when he came to himself? That means when he had an epiphany, an awakening, the light bulb came on. He now began to come to himself and what? He started examining who he really was and who his father was. And when he understood who he was, the son of a father that had great provision, he recognized he had an option. What do I need to do? Get myself out of this pig pen and go back to the house of my father and let my daddy be who he is without trying to interrupt him. What was in his mind that caused him to leave his daddy? Thinking, I need to be grown. I have news for you, old Christian. You can't ever get that grown where daddy doesn't love you and want to provide for you. He never made you to try to scuffle and hustle just all by yourself. That's not the daddy's, your father's heart. Your father's heart is that you would prosper and be blessed, even as your soul prospers. It's directly connected to your knowledge of him. And if you don't have knowledge of him, you're going to suffer. God says in his word, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My people are taken cap in captivity because they have no knowledge. And then he says, and they reject knowledge. What person would reject knowledge? A younger son that acts like he knows how life should go better than his father. Let's read on further. <clears throat> Verse 15. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with, hungry, with hunger? Let me read verse 17 again. This is what he said as he's in the pig pen, and he's looking at the pig food, thinking about, man, I need to eat that to try to survive. But then he's looking inwardly to reflect on where he came from. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? In other words, now I may be stupid, but I ain't stupid unto death. I'm gonna take my last breath here in the pig pen of life when God is my father? Verse 18. I will what? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Notice that he, rec he recognizes, man, there's some things you can do that's against God's operation and God's setup. So you can go against the way God set up heaven and find that heaven ain't working for you. You can go against the way God made gravity to work and gravity could be your worst enemy. There are some things that God set in motion. He's not going to stop just because you want it to stop. You'll get the best benefit out of it if you just go with the flow and you understand how things work. See, the older you get, you start paying attention. You're supposed to pay attention. Although there are some ridiculously stupid people. I remember when I was working at Ralph's as a manager, and uh, uh, I was a third manager in charge, and there was this older guy that came to me. And I mean, he had to be like almost in his 90s. He looked like he was in his 90s. I'm thinking he's got one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel. 
And he gets up on the side of me and he says, look at that girl over there. Look at her. Ooh, isn't she beautiful? Wouldn't you like to have some of that? And I'm looking at this old guy and I'm like, man, just because you're old don't mean you're smart. You got one foot on the gra- in the grave and the other foot on the banana peel and you don't know how God feels about fornication yet? Yet? All these years you've been breathing air and you still don't know how God feels about lusting after women? Yet? Do you spend any time in the Bible at all? I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, and he thinks he's got a listening ear. He don't know me at all. He don't know me. I'm a child of God. I'm a king and a priest. I'm a man of God. I have what I want at home. I'm good. I'm satisfied. I'm blessed beyond measure. You haven't figured this out yet, old man, about yourself? And you're getting ready to take one last breath to meet up with God, and you haven't figured this out yet. I was disgusted with it in a, in a way in which I was like, man, how you don't know? How you don't know? You spend all this time on this planet, and you still don't know the Bible. How you don't know? And then I came to this conclusion. Just because a person is older doesn't mean that they're smarter. There are some really unintelligent people that may even have clocked in years. But clocking in years, clocking in years doesn't necessarily make you smarter. You there in Luke chapter 15 still with me? What's the title of the message? Who is your daddy? That's the subtext, right? Subtitle. All right, Luke chapter 15. Verse 19, well, verse, let's look at verse 18. And I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. Now, whose suggestion was that? I said, whose suggestion was that? That was his. His daddy didn't tell him that, but that's what he figured I can come and offer. I don't have to be a status of a son. I can just be a slave to you, a hired servant. I'll be all right. Just, just let me be a hireling. That was his suggestion. That means that he's what? He still has some more learning to do, but he has learned this. He's learned where home is. He's learned that his daddy doesn't change. He's learned that provision is better than starvation. He's learned that life don't have to be just one way. You make the choice as to what kind of life you're going to live. And that's why when people say to me, oh, Pastor Ziegler, what about the poor? They asked the the Apostle Paul the same question. What about the poor, Paul? Don't forget the poor. Paul said, don't think that I'm going to forget about the poor. I'm not going to forget the poor. I'm always thinking, how can the poor be blessed? But the poor have the gospel preached unto them, which will change their thinking, which will allow them to participate in the inheritance which is given to all Christians. But if the poor says, I ain't listening to God, I'm not going to do what God says, then the poor will be poor always. You got to understand that. Having babies out of wedlock and having a bunch of financial bills that come from illegitimate, the children are not illegitimate, The children are legitimate, but the illegitimate behavior produces a strain on the finances. Divorces can wreck your finances. Not going to work can definitely have an impact on your health. Not being educated, don't know how to read, how to function, don't know how to listen to God, and concerned about God, that can have its grave effect upon you. The destruction of the poor, the Bible says, is their poverty. What do you mean? You don't want to learn. You may not be at the point where good can happen to you yet. Some people haven't figured that out yet. Young man came to me and said, give me some money. I need some money. Young man came to my car. Give me some money. I said, sir, do you have any children? I said, where do you live? I I, I said, what's going on with you? you, Where do you live? He said, I live on the streets and I need to get off the streets. I said, well, do you have any parents? He said, yeah, I got parents. I said, are your parents alive? He said, yeah, they're alive. I said, do they know you? He said, yeah, of course they know me. I said, why don't you go home to your parents? I'm sure they got a bed for you. 
See, I'm thinking about this example here. Your parents have a bed for you, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, why don't you go home? He said, well, I don't want to quit doing what I'm doing. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing drugs. I said, and then you have the gall to come to me, a stranger, and ask me for money to support you in something your own parents won't support you in? I'm not giving you a penny. I'm not giving you a penny. I'm not giving you a coat. I'm not giving you a cracker. I'm not giving you a piece of candy. You get nothing from me. Oh, you're cruel. Oh, you're cruel. No, I'm not. I'm trying to awake you to the reality that you may be like the prodigal son. You may be in the pig pen. You need to come to yourself. Because if you act like a wise son and repent and go to your parents, maybe they'll give you something to eat and a place to lay your head and look out for you. But see, if you want to continue being foolish and obeying the devil, the way of the transgressor is hard. Some people ain't concerned about God. They're not concerned about God. God, God says go to work. Did you know that's in the Bible? Go to work. That's in the Bible. A man that won't work shouldn't eat. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because he's denying the faith and is worse than an infidel if he calls himself a Christian. But see, I need to go ahead and borrow. I, you ain't borrowing. How are you going to borrow? borrow. You ain't pay, when you paid somebody back, you're not paying anybody back. You're just looking for a chump. And I'm not a chump. Go to work. Well, I'm willing to work. Well, come on, I'll take you to work. There was one lady. Oh, yeah, I remember this. I'm over my time. Uh, Y'all don't mind? This young lady, I was attending Crenshaw Christian Center. I'm just growing up in the Lord there. This young lady, she had children. And uh, Dr. Price stood her up in the church. He said, the young lady, stand up. And he stood her up and said, everybody look around. See her? And she's thinking, oh, yeah, I got my program going on, and everybody's going to support me in my program. See what she was doing? She'd come to church, and she'd beg for pe from people. She'd be begging. You come in and out of the church, she's begging. She sees you, and her little kids are by her side. She's using them. Give, can, you, can you help a sister out? Dr. Price said to her, in front of everybody, he said to the congregation, see that young lady? Everybody look at her. Everybody turned around and looked at her. He said, don't give her anything. And she's banned from this church. She's no longer allowed on these grounds. Ushers, take her out. She's no longer allowed to be on these church facilities. We've given her job opportunities. We've given her recommendation. She refuses to work. She uses the children as an opportunity to gain sympathy from people. She doesn't want to work. She's walked away from opportunities we've given her. All she wants to do is come here to beg. She is forbidden to be on this property. I had a pastor like that. That's my it's my father in the Lord. It's where I came from. A man that'll give it honestly straight from the hip and from the heart. Why? He told the truth. Now, some people were mad at him for doing that. They're like, oh, man, what kind of pastor would do that? Now, fast forward weeks later. I'm going into Ralph's. I'm not working at that Ralph's. I just am going there to get some groceries. And I go to get inside the, the, the store, and guess who stops me before I can get into, into the store? Lo and behold, little Miss Lady. And she says, can you give a, can you give a sister something? She said, oh, I could use the money. Can you, can you give a sister something? Let me hold something. You know what I mean? That was just whatever a patent statement was. And I said, aren't you the lady that Dr. Price said that you're not allowed to go to the church because you have a habit of begging. And then, to see, the covers came off, and she started cursing me out. She wasn't a Christian. She wasn't acting like a Christian. And what I'm telling you all, you better wake up and be wise. We're at a day and time now. If you don't take time to acquaint yourself with the word, there are people that are waiting to run you down. Pay attention. Wake up. Be alert. The information you're getting is life-changing and long-lasting. We're not wasting your time and we're not entertaining you. We're giving you information that will bless you and allow you to be able to progress in these days ahead. And the people that won't receive this information from God, when I say this information, I'm talking about the Bible. We're just reading the Bible. You're there in Luke chapter 15 still? Yes. All right, read on further. All right. Verse 20. 
And he arose, this is a certain, the, the son that said, just treat me like one of your servants, O dad. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had what? Compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. That's his estimation. That's not what his daddy said. But that's his estimation of himself. Some Christians have a poor self-image. Why? They don't know their self in Christ. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know their position in Christ. They don't know what really happened when they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They don't know what status they really have with God. And their estimation of themselves is, I'm just a lowly Christian. I guess I can't do anything. I'm just, you know, whatever happens is going to happen. You don't even know who you are. You don't even know who you are. You have abilities to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You have the ability in the name of Jesus to cast out demons. You have the ability to pray in the name of Jesus and your prayers be answered. You have the ability to have contact, personal, intimate conversation with the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. Why are you talking about yourself as if you're a pauper? As if you're a slave, you're unworthy. That's crazy talk. And then you hear Christian music. Oh, I'm so unworthy. I'm just unworthy. Oh, I'm blessed, but I don't deserve it. Well, what do you think? God's stupid? He's just giving out blessings to those that don't deserve it? Saying, you got to even listen to the music you're listening to, that you're hearing. And some people are like pastors. They, oh, man, you just talk. Are you complaining? I'm not complaining. I'm trying to awaken you to the fact that the enemy is trying to put propaganda on you all the time. Trying to tell you why pray. Your prayers won't get answered. Your God can't do for you, but he can do for others. What you see in the Bible, that's just in the Bible days, not for now. I'm saying to you, that there are lies the enemy is bringing against you. And if you don't awaken unto righteousness and sin not, the devil will have you thinking crazy about your own father. You won't want to talk to him boldly and expect that when you pray and talk to him that you believe you receive if you have a bad self-image of yourself. Or if you think all you are is what? Is flesh and bone and blood. You are spirit, and God is the father of your spirit, and he loves you. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. That means your spirit dwells down in here. You're more than a physical body. You're more than a kiss. Some people just reduce everything down to sex. You're more than an orgasm. I am who I am because of who I have an orgasm with. Are you kidding me? God is your father. You get your identification in Christ Jesus. Okay, let me read on. Verse 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the what? The best robe. So that tells you what? Daddy has some closets filled with robes. And he said, pick out the best one. That means daddy understands what's better, best, and what's not the best. And daddy said, you get my son the best one. What else did he say? And put it on him. That means he only have to dress himself. Decorate my son. And put a ring on his hand. That means daddy got some jewelry up in the house. Put a ring on his hand. And then he said, what else? And put some shoes on my boy's feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. See, son, did you really think about this? You went out there to live, uh, to try to have a party, and the party was at home already. You went to have a barbecue with other people, but the barbecue was in the house. You went to have music over there, and we got musicians here. You went out there to try to find some sexual satisfaction, and we got sexual satisfaction here doing it God's way. Are you getting the point? 
that in daddy's house there's provision, there is, there is struggle and lack outside of daddy's house. Some people don't understand that. One time a couple gave me a key to a BMW. They said, Pastor, whoever God tells you to give it to, give it to them. I said, thank you very much. I'll drive it. No, I'm just teasing. <clears throat> I don't particularly like BMW. Even if I did, that's not the instruction that was given to me. I want to follow instructions. I'm going to follow the instructions. I'm not here to get anybody's stuff. Me and Daddy got it going on. Whatever I want, he gives it to me. He gives it to me. Nobody in here can say I owe them anything. Anybody can raise their hand and say, Pastor Ziegler, you owe me some money. You borrowed some money from me. You tried to get over on me. You got me in a transaction that was not cool, and I came out on the short end of the stick. Turn around. Anybody here that can say that? Raise your hand now. You want me to close my eyes? You want me to turn around? Anybody? No. No. I must know what I'm talking about. I must believe what I'm talking about. There's provision in the house of the Father. Now, some ministers would not ask that question. They would not ask that question at all. Why? They're too busy trying to get people involved in pyramid schemes and everything else, making money off the people. And they would never ask, never ask that question, especially on World Wide Web. Are you kidding me? Ask the people, is anybody in here can say that they've been done wrong by me? Some pastors would never, they'd go to their grave, deny, deny, deny. They never would ask that question. Now, here's what I'm saying. When you walk in line with the word and you choose to trust God, you come to this awareness that God loves you. And he's good to all that call upon him. When you take time to meditate in his word and let his word become his love letters to you and you understand how wonderful and sweet and marvelous he is and that he lacks for nothing, life becomes enjoyable. You're walking like Jesus walks. Jesus wasn't ripping people off. Jesus gave to the poor as he was directed to the Holy Ghost. But nobody was getting over on him. Jesus is our example. And the Father has more provision than anybody can imagine or think or even hope for. He goes way beyond what you can imagine or think or even hope for. Then why are Christians suffering? Ignorance. 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 Would I say a beautiful thing about that subject? Ignorance is a what? Curable condition. It's a curable condition. You can, you can do better. And the more you study the word, the more you acquaint yourself with him, be at peace, and good will come unto you. And I have to quit because I run out of time. I love you all. I love you all. In Jesus' name. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father, and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for saving me. And thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.